today's podcast, we were with Sari Taylor. Sari is a coach, but not in the way you would think it. She's not a business coach or anything like that. She helps ladies with severe anxiety and people who have got mental health issues. Sari is somebody who speaks from experience. She had also suffered with mental health issues to the point where she was put into the Priory for a month. So she comes from this with just a completely different viewpoint. She's somebody who completely understands what women are going through and men too. She has her own coaching service. We talked about a lot of strategies that actually don't work controversially. And we spoke about Sari's ethos, which is based on the three principles. I don't want to ruin the chat any more than that. It's absolutely mind blowing if you ask me. I think it's a conversation that was so important to have because we are living in a quote unquote mental health crisis and there is a lot of chat about it. There's a lot of medications. I know that our else or our customers suffer with this when they get to a certain stage of life. And I think if you listen to this and you try and understand the coping techniques that she suggests, I think it'll really help you. So enjoy the chat. Hi, Sari. Hi. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I first came across you and your work. Um, a friend, um, we've got a mutual friend, mm -hmm. and I saw you talking at the Brood event in Manchester. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, I thought what you were talking about was great. And I thought mm, this lady that a lot of my ladies on the podcast would like to listen to and mm -hmm. engage with. Yeah. So that's why I'm here today, basically. Yeah. So let's take it from the beginning. Okay, yeah. You... Um, kind of help ladies kind of like a therapist mm -hmm. you'll go into it better than I am going to like bastardize it right now um <laughs> kind of like <laughs> a, kind of like a well, therapist can be bothered. but we will get into that because <laughs> that's not your only job um but it comes from deep experience mm -hmm. so why don't you take us back to yeah. how you came to be in this position okay so Growing up was very, what would be seen as really confident, probably borderline cocky, um, you know, a bit like if someone said something to me, I'd make sure they paid for it 10 times over type confidence. And finished school, went to university, traveled the world with my now husband at the time. And, you know, seemingly everything was, was fine, was good. And then I suddenly went from what felt like, I see now it wasn't quite this simple, but it felt like in the space of about a three week period, I would just not leave the house. The anxiety was so severe. I know it sounds a bit cheesy this, but you know that phrase climbing the walls, it was like, I literally just for the first time understood what that meant. When I say I was climbing the walls, I was literally like wanted to, I'd be sat on the desk, I'm gonna make myself sound so mental now, but I'd be like sat on a desk, like almost trying to get higher than the floor to like escape my own head. Like it sounds really weird, but I was, it was the most severe, scary, frightening experience I've ever experienced. And that then led into, you know, a level of health anxiety, thinking I'm having a heart attack, what's wrong with me, you know, severe weight loss. And in the end, I pretty much begged the doctor to send me somewhere because I just didn't have a clue what was happening, what to do. Um, I'd been in a &E numerous times and thinking... That, sorry, how old were you at this point? So I was in my early 20s then. Right. 21, 22. And could you think back to any particular trigger or did you just wake up one morning and start having these feelings? It felt like it was pretty instant. I know that I had um, a horrible water infection, UTI around the time. And I think that had sort of depleted me and I wasn't feeling well, but you wouldn't just get that from having that. Mm. It was, I was a massive overthinker and didn't realise. And my defence mechanism was being cocky, being confident, being funny, being all of those things. And so everyone just thought I was fine and so did I. But actually looking back, I was a massive overthinker from a very, very young age, was extremely hypervigilant. And I don't, I don't talk about this too much only because I don't want to put my mum in a difficult position. My dad's died now, but my dad was an alcoholic. And he, so me and my sister, for example, we'd sit at the window at night and we'd wake each other up and we'd do shifts to see if, if he was coming home. And so, so I was actually extremely hypervigilant as a child, but it was just the norm. So I didn't know, mm. didn't realize. Um, and I think that just carried with me and then caught up with me eventually. Um, which is what had happened when I ended up getting put into uh, hospital. Yeah, sorry, so I interrupted then. So you went to the doctor and you Just begged, begged them. them to send me, like, please help me, send me somewhere. And I was fortunate enough that the place I worked, I had um, private health insurance. So 
I got sent to the Priory, which I know has a bit of a reputation, like, ooh, the Priory, that's Going, where all the yeah, celebs Yeah, celebrities go. go to dry out. But it's actually, it's just a shithole. It's horrible. It's, yeah, it's got nicer carpets and curtains than a mental hospital in general, but it's still a horrible, you know, environment in that sense. So I went there and I went there for a full month. Now, this is a whole other story that, you know, probably won't want me to go into now, but I went there and what they probably should have done is given me a little respite for a few days and sent me home, but they kept me for a month because my insurance covered me for a month as an inpatient. Mm. So I ended up coming out of there, very institutionalized, even more scared of the world, but actually pretty chill because I was drugged up. (laughs) Massively. Right. Okay. So what? So what was their kind of diagnosis, or what did they, they put you on? So I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, acute panic disorder, depression. I think that was it. Um, so I was on antidepressants, like the highest possible dose I could be on. I was on beta blockers, and I was also on Valium about four times a day. Wow. Mm. Like. <sighs> Even if you just took one of those, yeah, like I've absolutely. taken a beta blocker sometimes when I do a bit of public speaking, just mm-hmm. to like, yeah, kind of, it's common people yeah, do, yeah, absolutely, tiny dose, and it just takes the edge off. Great, yeah. So big fan of it in that respect. But she always says, you know, don't be taking any of these. Like this, these are really highly addictive, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Mm-hmm. I would never. And I become a lot va- like vacant when mm-hmm. I do it. Yeah. So to do that every day, plus the Valium, plus the antidepressants, plus mm-hmm. that, they all come with their own side effects as well. They slow the heart down. Mm-hmm. They slow uh, your nervous system down. You're kind of like, yeah, in a dazed and confused Yeah, and but the, at the time, experience. that dazed and confused experience is preferable than the oh, feeling yeah. like you're going to drop dead and have a heart attack in a minute. So it's kind of like the lesser of two evils. But again, looking back now, they, they shouldn't have, they, they, that shouldn't have been what they did with me. Um because again, it's then you start feeling like, well, how on earth am I ever going to come off these? So when yeah. I started to think, all oh, I wanted a child, I came off the Valium first and then I came off the beta blockers and then stayed on the antidepressants. But it took me a long time to do that. And I would still carry them around in my handbag just on the off chance that I would need them. So they were like my crutch really. But when I wanted to have a baby, um, I was twenty. by the time I got to 29, that was when I was like, how am I going to do this? So they'd not really given me any insight or any kind of, help in terms of how how on earth am I going to get past this? There was therapy sessions. There was group therapy. And the only thing I remember is this woman, bless her, this old woman saying, we're going to try and think positive. So let's look at um, some things that we want to do. Have anyone got any dreams or desires that they want to do? And I'm sat there thinking, I don't even want to get up in the morning. So no, I haven't got any mm. fucking dreams or desires right at this moment. I think she was sort of hit, not hitting the mark really. And then I had to come up with something. So I said, I want to swim with sharks one day. And I think, I don't know why. <laughs> like, I have no desire to swim with yeah. sharks. But you know, you just like think of something big. Um, so that just, yeah, was not was no use whatsoever. But then when I came out of the Priory, um, I, I was still really ashamed and embarrassed of where I'd ended up because I was a bit of a tough cookie, you know, in my view and everyone else's. It was like, oh, you know, you don't want to seem like a failure. So I realised that if you train as a psychotherapist in the UK, you have to be in therapy every week. Right. And so that was kind of my in. So I put on a front for the interview. How I got on that course, I'll never know. Nobody, they didn't know I was on medication because I wasn't going to tell them. Um, but I got on it and, you know, that was my start of me going into therapy and stuff and just starting to get a bit of a better understanding. But I did still suffer every sort of 18 months, two years. I would still burn out, usually around this time of year, Christmas time, um, and end up back in bed for three, four weeks. Right, so... Did you manage to come off all the drugs to have your daughter? Yes. Okay, and how was that? So the pregnancy was fine. I was okay during the pregnancy. Um, and But at the time, my sister's a type 1 diabetic. She hadn't been diagnosed. So she ended up very close to a coma in intensive care when I was six months pregnant. So that was the start of a really stressful time. And then mm. my dad, a month later, got diagnosed with terminal cancer. So it was a really stressful yeah. time. So by the time the baby came, Maya, who's now... 16 <laughs> to be honest with you I was struggling just to function and so I just wanted the baby out of me healthy and then I kind of felt like I could fall apart which is what I did really right so I had a lot of support from my husband was amazing my mum was brilliant um and it was yeah just a really scary overwhelming time so then I went back on the medication um it was the only way I knew to get myself some relief um and then again just continued going through those cycles which is why I didn't 
I would have loved, always, I came from a big family, I'm one of five, I wanted loads of kids, but that scared me so much that I felt like I'm not capable of having any more kids because it's not fair on the baby for me being postnatally anxious. Um, I'm not capable, I'm not resilient enough. And so I didn't have children um, again after that and then ended up falling pregnant aged 45 <laughs> um, by chance, uh, wasn't planned. And I'm really grateful for that now because, you know, I'm she's 15 months now and it's been hard, it's tiring, it's overwhelming, but I've not had any anxiety whatsoever. So that's interesting. So, okay, so do you feel like you've done so much? Well, first of all, congratulations on having um, another little girl, is it? Yeah, it yeah, is, yeah. Okay, at 45, like, wow. Because mm -hmm. everyone will tell you the odds of that are well against you. Mm -hmm. And also you're high risk. Yeah. You're a geriatric mother. I sure am. <laughs> we had a lady on the podcast uh, a few weeks ago and she was became a mother at 43. Mm -hmm. And when every all the chances were against her again, mm -hmm. she did it naturally. And again, mm -hmm. this has happened to you naturally. Mm -hmm. Um and just Wait. the once, I mean, I know that's a bit too much detail, but I, I think it's important <laughs> to say because people do. I know I'm really fortunate and I get that and I know it doesn't happen for everyone, but I like to say it because I think it's important to know, one, if you don't want a child, don't risk it. Yeah. <laughs> and two, it can happen. Like it was literally one night away, that was it yeah. at age 45. I actually thought I was already perimenopausal. I might have been because yeah. it still can happen of course. Um, during that time. So it's, you know, just never say never. <laughs> How has the experience been being a um, quote unquote older mother? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I mean, obviously, first time around, you were full of anxiety. Yeah. Your dad had just got a mm -hmm. terminal cancer mm -hmm. diagnosis. Yeah. Your sister's very ill. Yeah. And you, you, you know, you're a new mum with all this anxiety. Mm -hmm. I know I've given birth, she's 13 months now, my little girl, and I'd never experienced anxiety in my life. Never understood it, couldn't really get on with it. I was, very kind of unsympathetic towards it. And women who had it, I just thought they'd been soft. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> just go out and do a gym class, yeah, get will on with you? It. Get that stress <laughs> out of you. Stop overthinking it. Mm -hmm. And everybody always tells me, you're so strong, you're so strong. I'm like, mm. And they, then when I had my little girl, my God, did I notice anxiety. Mm -hmm. But I think that was, no it's normal. It is normal. And this is one of mine. This is a bit controversial, really, because there'll be people you know, that are really into diagnosis and think diagnosis are important and they've got their place. But for me, so many women are diagnosed with postnatal depression and anxiety when actually what they're experiencing is a very, very normal experience that if they just took the pressure off, lowered their expectations of themselves, was more open about asking for help and are, you know, when we need it, it just makes a huge, huge difference. And, and, I was almost told that even though it was, you know, I've been 10 years now without without generalised anxiety or anything, you know, so all these diagnoses I had, I no longer have. There's no way you could diagnose me with it. It's just so far removed from who I am now. But even then, it's like the doctors, well, oh, you had postnatal depression, anxiety with your daughter. And they'll tell you that you're something like 60, 70% more likely to get it if you've already experienced anxiety. And, blah, blah. and this is just the dialogue that we go along with. So before a woman's even had a baby, she's almost, if she's had anxiety before, almost preempting this is what's going to happen. And we're setting ourselves up massively. I think we are because I yeah, felt anxiety, felt anxious, didn't want to go out the house, um, didn't want to see anyone, didn't want anybody to come around to the house mm -hmm. that wasn't my partner. Yeah. Totally offended everybody by saying, no, you're not coming round. Good. <laughs> I don't care. It's about me and the baby right now. But again, I'm a very vocal woman. I feel sorry for people who get railroaded into feeling this mm -hmm. and that became, creates crippling anxiety in them. Mm -hmm. Would I have gone to the doctor and said I've got crippling anxiety so they could diagnose me with it and then say you've got personal... No, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. No, never. Yeah. Because I just thought I'll deal with it myself. Because that's the other thing is like the diagnosis that we get. And for me, I'm very much... If someone comes to me and they're like, oh, I think I've got a diagnosis of OCD or this or that. And I'm like not interested in the nicest possible way because for me... All I want to do is help you understand more so that you can just feel better when you wake up in the morning, that you can just go out. You know, even simple things like not a lot of people realise that when we wake up in the morning, the body gives us a natural boost of adrenaline. So if you're already hypervigilant because you're overthinking, mm. mornings are worse. But then people go, oh, I'm terrible in the morning and start cancelling the rest of their day because mm. they just don't know that simple fact that it's normal to have that boost in the morning. Yeah. That's how I know when I'm getting stressed because I feel off in the morning. And that's like my wake up call. Oh, come on. 
you must be overthinking. Even though I'm not noticing the thoughts as such, I know my body's telling me I am because I'm feeling it, that little pit of your stomach in the morning because that's just excess adrenaline. And it's there's so many simple things. Whereas if you go to the doctor, and again, you know, I'm not dissing doctors, they're amazing. But my experience is that a lot of doctors don't fully understand mental health. It's not their fault. It's, you know, the way the system works. But it's like, okay, well, here's a, here's a medic medication. And a, there is a place for medication. If I felt I needed it, I wouldn't have any qualms of going and getting it. But it's not always the answer in the sense of you then take that and you then think you're at the mercy of this tablet. The way mm. you feel is at the mercy of this tablet. And it's so disempowering that, okay, have the tablet, but also help people with the understanding. But that's what people don't don't get I also feel to. like you're not deficient in no. sertraline or citalopram or whatever they're going to give you mm -hmm. you aren't deficient in that mm -hmm. if you're literally in an acute position where it's life or death okay have it yeah. if you are not there's things you can do yeah there's, because... there's understanding that can help you so the way I explain antidepressants and again I'm not medically trained so I just need to say that but the way it almost works in a psychological sense is it's like if you think about a waterfall running, rivers running clear, and then you're throwing a load of shit in there, rubbish, it's getting contaminated. That is like our mind. When we're overthinking and we're overanalyzing, it's like we're throwing a load of stuff in. The sertraline or the antidepressant is almost like a giant sanitizer. So it gives you a little bit of clarity for a bit, and sometimes which is needed to get us out of that black hole or to help us get up in the morning. But then it doesn't the stop you throwing there. shit in it. Yeah. So it, that and that's why people say they're addictive. I don't believe they're addictive. What I feel no. happens is you get so reliant on them and you believe it's the only way that you feel addicted to it. Because mm. it's like, well, I, it's the only way I'll feel better is if I have this. So, you know, and actually once I started to understand and, and reduce the level of overthinking that I was doing and, and feeling a lot less stressed, as I say, if I needed to take tablets, if I was in a dark hole, I'd go and take them. But I wouldn't, I know I wouldn't be addicted. Mm. I said to you this before, but um, I'm not immune to anxiety. I get it all the time if I'm a bit stressed and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but I look at it as that my body's trying to tell me something here and I, it's an actual superpower. That yeah. is like a little alarm system mm -hmm. for me. Absolutely. If there's a situation that is off and I'm not facing that and I keep ignoring it and I keep ignoring it and I keep ignoring it, the anxiety will still keep running. I, yeah. If I just deal with it face head on, sometimes I'm like, don't want to open that text message. So I think about it and I go, open it, yeah. read it. It's never bad. Yeah. But you have to deal with it head on. I'm somebody who's very practical, deal with it head mm -hmm. on and it dissipates mm -hmm. or have that hard, tough conversation. Yeah. It's getting, it's about getting comfortable with the discomfort sometimes. And that's, so, you know, when we send a message to our brain that there's a problem or danger, like you say, oh, there's a text message, that's instantly sending a message to your brain that there's yeah. a problem. It's going to then put adrenaline in your system. You're going to feel the discomfort when actually, you know, someone asked me this question only yesterday in, the mem in my me online membership saying, why is the build-up always worse than the actual thing? It's like, well, of course it is, because that's the story we're creating. We can make that as dramatic or as impactful as we want when the reality is often it's nowhere near as bad as we think it's going to be. Um, and again, it's just understanding that for people. But there are different levels of, you know, once somebody's overproducing adrenaline for a certain period of time, then they'll start producing stress ho hormone cortisol. And that's where it can feel really, mm. really severe and it can feel very difficult to come out of. But it does still work in the same way that it's about us taking a breather and, and, and settling and not keep adding fuel to that fire all the time, which is what people are doing essentially yeah. when they're really anxious. I mean, I've got friends who will not address their anxiety or whatever. They, they, high functioning anxiety mm -hmm. they've got. One in particular is coming to mind. And um, <laughs> she won't address it. Or she does try and address it, but she, you know, and I can see it in her. I see it that, you know, I look at her nails at first alarming and they're like bitten to death. And mm -hmm. I think yeah, you're stressed. Yeah. But I don't know what the answer is sometimes. So what are the kind of strategies that you teach people that are not kind of like take beta blockers? So this is, again, the thing that's a little bit controversial is that there aren't any strategies. Like if you go online and type strategies for reduced anxiety, there are thousands. Mm. You can find them everywhere. You know, anything like count the tiles on the ceiling, you know, count from 100 backwards, all of these things that might work for a minute. Relaxation might work for a bit, but you can always override that with the power of thought. You can always, so I always remember in the Priory, one of the other things, you had this like full on timetable. So you'd have to do relaxation in the mornings, then you'd have to do the gyms. 
as soon as I would lie down in the relaxation, my mind would start, oh my God, how long am I going to be here for? How long, you know, I don't want to be here. And so I'd start feeling really anxious. And I'm like, lay in this room and they're telling me, this is what you need. This is what's good for you. But if you're in your mind telling yourself this isn't what you want, then it's it's not going to feel relaxing. So this is what I said to my friend. I said, you need to do yoga. Like you as a person need to do yoga. You need to slow down. She's like, no, I can't. Like I can't stop overthinking when I'm... She said, I just can't do it. And I was like, you more than anyone I know need to do it. Yeah, but it doesn't always work because it's... We're experiencing everything day to day through our thoughts. We're always feeling our thinking. So yoga can be great if we have really you know, the thoughts around it is that I want to do this, it feels beneficial, this mm. is relaxing, then we're going to feel that. If we're going, I don't want to do this, I'm only doing it because people have told me to, yeah. then we're not going to relax into it because it's all internal. It all comes from the inside out. And so even yoga, even exercise, everything external, we have the ability to to experience it in a different way to somebody else because we're doing it through our thoughts, essentially. Yeah, I always say to her, why don't you slow down and ask yourself what you want then? Like, I think like meditation yeah. because then if you just like sit there and think what are you thinking about yeah. but I think obviously her mind would be thinking about yeah. things that are like completely irrelevant yeah. work and when I was sat in meditation I, I you know because I've done all of these things to the nth degree I didn't just do things by art so if I when I thought when someone told me meditation would be good for my anxiety I found a, a Buddhist center and went and sat with monks instead yeah. like it was like I'm like, doing it properly yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it I'm doing yeah. it properly I used to just sit there just thinking I can't sit still. How do I sit still? What if I need to run out that door? What if it was the most awful, uncomfortable experience for me mm. ever? Um, always stemmed from, I remember you saying about yoga. When I was in the Priory, that was another thing that they encouraged us to do, yoga. And I wrote about this in my book. It was the, like one of the most embarrassing things. At the time, I wouldn't be bothered now, but at the time, because I was so anxious and on edge, this, again, this little old lady was just so sweet. I mean, she's probably not even that old. She seemed at the time, but she's so sweet and she's helping us get in these positions. I'm laying on the floor with my legs in the air and she pushes me and it it forces me to do the most loudest fart oh I've ever heard <laughs> in this room of people that I don't know. I'm sat on that and they're like, this is mortifying. I just need the ground to swallow me up. She just pretended like it hadn't happened and they'll sort of div it up. And I was like, that is my yoga career done. That is it. It's <laughs> over. God. So again, like I said, at least there's no fit men there or something. Do you know what I mean? That there were men worse. there. There were men there. But I wasn't looking because I was just so in my head, just so anxious that I didn't <sighs> see what was going on around. But yeah, it's uh so again, everything we experience, if we're stressed and tense, that we're going to experience it in a stressed and tense way, which is why it's not about strategies. What I do is teach people understanding of how they work as human beings because I just found over time with the un- with understanding that even though I'd see my brain going a million miles an hour it was like I just suddenly stopped getting so stressed I was like why am I not panicking about this it's because I then knew too much yeah okay so let's delve into that so um now you help ladies or men you've yeah. got a coaching group mm-hmm. um and you were saying that most of your clients are in the USA yep um and what is it that you do to like unpack their anxiety, unpack their issues mm-hmm. and where do they begin kind of like, you know, you're living the life without medication and you, you've got these great strategies that you can pull on and you know so much. And now birth number two was nowhere near as bad as birth number one mm-hmm. because you've done so much work on yourself mm-hmm. and now you're helping other people. So mm-hmm. what do you The do? irony is I've done a lot less work and that's what's helped. I was okay. trying far too hard for so many years, like literally the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, have you heard of an alpha stim? No. It's like a contraption that, again, people rave about it, but it's like this, cost about a grand. And I remember it was like, I was trying everything. And I ordered this machine thinking it was going to change my life. So I'm literally waiting for it to come the next day. I think that came from the USA. And the idea was you put these little things on your earlobes and it sent an electric current to your brain that would settle your anxiety. So I was like, this is going to be life changing. Right. I was holding out hope for everything. As soon as I opened it in the box, I took it out, put the thing on my ear, and then suddenly in my head I went, what if it messes up the messages in my brain? What if it sends a, bre- a message to my brain that it's not supposed to send and it makes me worse? Mm. That was it. Back in the box, sent, refund, that was over. So there's nothing that I hadn't tried, and, it, and that was it. I was trying too hard, and it was almost like... I'd go to the end of the day and go, oh, today's been terrible because I might have experienced two panic attacks, which might have taken up 40 minutes of my day, but there were still many hours in the day when actually I was all right and I was resilient and I was I was functioning just fine, but we don't look at that. We focus on 
the negativity of what we need to change and how broken we are. And so a lot of it is helping people see that they're not broken, helping them understand more about how thoughts work. So I can say to you, your thoughts create your feelings. It's all inside out. And you can get that on an intellectual level, but we need to get it on a much deeper level for it to make an, you know, a lasting uh, change. So my job is really just exploring that with people, teaching them how it works, teaching them about how um, your consciousness levels shift and change and that affects your mood and your state of mind. But again, you, we might feel that we're in a bad mood, but if we start seeing that as a really terrible thing, we're feeding it. Whereas if I feel flat, I don't get too caught up in the idea that I'm feeling flat. I just slow myself down. I just, I'm more patient with myself, more compassionate. I don't need to see it as, oh God, what's wrong with me? So a lot of it is really simple, really simple, basic stuff. And about, again, people being a bit more patient and compassionate with themselves. You know, one of the things I'll, if I do a session, say on love and compassion, I know it sounds dead cheesy, but, and I'll say to people, right, let me know in the chat or put your hand up. If, do you love yourself? And people find it so cringe and so uncomfortable. It's like, oh. No, I really love myself. Good. Really and, that, do. and that's the thing is like, <laughs> why are we, at what point do we start not loving ourselves? And it's I all know. of that. Because I noticed as I started to recover from the anxiety, I started to notice that there was a massive link between when I was in like a bit of a self-loathing and yeah. anxiety and I'd hate myself for feeling anxious, for feeling like a failure. And again, it just fed that cycle. So it's just getting people to understand how all of that works. So they start to see for themselves and they'll come back to me and say, I've just realised this. Or they'll have little insights that don't seem major, but build up to a very different experience. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, and this is why I'm like, can't sometimes understand like how people think or feel. I'm like, how can you not look in the mirror and like, like love yourself or whatever? Mm -hmm. I do get it. Um, you know, people's situations are different. If they're stressed about like money or financially stressed or, um, you know, parents are, poorly or things like that and then their environment isn't great mm -hmm. then they might be arguing with their partner mm -hmm. then that feeds into their confidence and then they might feel like they've got old overnight and we hear that a lot yeah. um, but there's always always no matter what you're experiencing in life there's always there's always access to more peace of mind mm. regardless of what's going on in your external environment and I know it sounds dramatic but so so I said, was saying before that when I was pregnant the first time, my dad made it till she was nine months old. And so grieving for him was a very anxious time. Mm. Like I know grief is obviously sad and, you know, that's all normal, but I was so anxious. And then lost my uncle a few years ago, who was probably just as close to me as my dad. So on a, on a par with my dad, if not actually more of a, a father figure in a lot of ways. And as much as him dying of cancer was so sad and heart-wrenching, I didn't experience the same fear and anxiety. Mm. So yes, we experience, you know, feelings are normal, sadness is normal, grieving is normal. What isn't a necessity or normal is that added suffering that is the anxiety where we're almost resisting just what is and accepting where we're at and, and who we are. And that's, and again, it's so simple, but people get so good at talking themselves out of it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's all right for you because you're really attractive or it's all right for you because you've got this. Or I once spoke, had a conversation with someone who works with people in a high income bracket that's something like the top 1% or something, like people that have got billions of pounds. And the amount of stress around money in those people is way more severe than people with a lot less in the bank. Because again, it's not just because you've got all that money. Of course, they then worry about it more because what if you lose it? If you've got... You know, what if you you have a lifestyle that you need that? And, you know, people tell themselves, oh, if I have more money, I'll be all right. If I've got a better relationship, I'll be all right. If I've got this, and actually it comes from inside. Well, I had this exact conversation with a friend of mine last night who came around who was, you know, got all the wealth he could imagine, but is like sat there. He was asking me, if you sold your business, you know, would you, would you not, would you not want to like live in Dubai and like then you won't have to pay tax or anything? And I was like, well... You know what? What lovely problems we have. Like what a lovely problems we have that I have to pay millions of pounds in tax. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I was literally sat there going, "Let's worry about that when that happens." Yeah. Because yeah? it's not it, everything it isn't every, as well. Yeah. And you know what? Probably not going to happen anyway. Mm. But um, he was legitimately sat there thinking, getting really stressed about it. And I'm like, I'm like, he's thinking, well, maybe I buy a boat. And I'm like, all right, well, whatever. Yeah. But it's, it, I was just a bit like. 
these problems are not problems. They are not problems, mm -hmm. you know, and you are like stressing yourself out, overthinking everything. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. and I know this is an extreme example, but I once worked with, um, with a, a couple who one was very spontaneous and the other was very planned and had wanted five year plan, 10 year plan. And we're trying to find a balance where like, okay, understand we need to plan to a degree because we've got responsibilities, but at the same time, why can't we be more spontaneous? And actually, really sadly, he died. Um, and he was a spontaneous one. And, no, he was the right, one that planner. wanted the plan. And, and I know that's a really drastic way of looking at this, but the, we don't always have the gift of that future. Yeah. And all we've got is now. And I don't suggest that people, you know, throw caution to the wind and yeah, be it's irresponsible. Yeah, like YOLO, let's just yeah. blitz, blitz everything <laughs> yeah. and who cares? But there is a middle ground of like, you know, let things take care of themselves because we will always find a way. Apologies for interrupting this podcast, but I need to ask a favour. If you're enjoying this podcast so far, then please hit that subscribe button right now. I'll be straight up and honest that I want to see this podcast grow and flourish into something that I'm really proud of. And the only way that I can do that is with your help. So if you've ever learned anything useful from these conversations, then please return the favour by liking, rating, subscribing, and maybe even sharing it with your friends. Thanks very much. Let's get back to the episode. So your style of coaching is very specific. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk us through that and how you learned? So I actually came across these, uh, it's called The Three Principles and it's by Sydney Banks. And I would urge anybody who wants more peace of mind in their life to go and uh, look it up. Sid Banks is, is dead now, he's no longer alive. He was actually a welder in Scotland who just like had this epiphany in his own, own life and then ended up sharing with lots of other people. It's really- I bet he had the most simplistic life of anybody. Oh, well, well, he did once he, <laughs> once he came across this, he definitely did. And then- so people, there's still people alive that sort of trained and shared direct, di directly with him who have then been my mentors. So one of my um, most favourite, I mean, I've got a lot of favourite mentors, but one of my most favourite who I initially came across these three principles with is a psychiatrist, a very well-known psychiatrist in the US, very experienced. Mm -hmm. He's trained as a GP as well and other things, like a very, very intelligent man. And he suffered with depression on and off uh, for many, many years until his 40s. And then he came across Sid Banks and that changed his life and his world. So he then shared these principles within his practice as a psychiatrist and got phenomenal results and outcomes. Um, so there's, there's lots of people who now share that in the US that come from all sorts of backgrounds. You don't have to have a medical background. There are psychotherapists like me that come across it. Um, and what happens is, or what my experience, and I know a lot of other people's is, Having invested lots of money and time and effort into my training as a psychotherapist, you know, I did, I worked in prisons doing CBT, home, children's homes doing DBT. I've trained in hypnotherapy, NLP. Like there's nothing I haven't done. And it was always to try and find the answer to my own anxiety. Um, and then I came across just a podcast or a, a YouTube video of his once and just something really resonated with me that he said and it just got me curious and interested. So I started to explore and then I've gone on to... What did he say? So what did he say in that moment? I, can't, I don't actually know what he said in that moment, but the three principles are... Okay, it's going to sound a bit woo-woo and it's very far removed from who I was as a person, but I would class myself as quite spiritual now. We're all spiritual anyway as humans by nature but it's mind thought and consciousness that we're exploring and how those things work together to give us the experience of, of a, as a human being and so that's what I now do is share that understanding of those three principles in the same way that I've learned from other people and what I love about it now is I've had people that say joined my membership so one particular lady who I do a podcast with in the US called Lily she came into my membership she was a school psychologist but she had really severe OCD eating disorder loads of different things going on she came in my membership exploring the three principles and it changed her life and now she coaches other people so it's a lovely trickle of people you get to a point where I was like, I can't work as a psychotherapist anymore. I can't go down a path that I know for me didn't give me the results and the life and the change of life that I now have with this simplistic um, three principles knowledge. And so I had to change the way I worked and I had to almost drop all of my psychotherapy practice because you couldn't really do the two because psychotherapy overcomplicates what I'm teaching. Yeah. Or what I'm sharing. And so I've had to, I've almost like gone a little bit less intelligent over the years, yeah. but a lot happier and more content. It's yeah. all very simplistic now. No, I bet. 
Um, and so that's, you know, again, it's a, it's a lovely community of people. It's not as big as I'd like it to be. Part of my mission is getting just general Joe public people to, to know about these three principles because it is so life changing. <laughs> Mental health is like a huge topic right now. Mm -hmm. Everyone seems to have mental health mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. apart from me. I mm -hmm. literally turn around and say I haven't got any. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that. And that's not me being cocky or anything. I'm just like, no, I just don't think I have. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I experience like down days and whatever, but I like pull myself up kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. Like, let's not overthink it. Mm -hmm. And I really feel for people, like I said, my friend with high functional anxiety, I really feel for people who just like can't like... Mm -hmm and can't really understand it or don't know what to do to get out mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. Are we overcomplicating it then? Yes, massively. And and people will really criticise me for this. I, You know, it's funny because when I started sharing these principles, I could see colleagues and other therapists like, what are you doing? Like, you know, that's not right or that's not... You know, even just something as simple, and again, I would get shot for saying this, but I've got to be true to myself and, you know... Um, that as a psychotherapist, and I really enjoyed my training, and I, you know, and I'm not saying don't go and see a psychotherapist. Absolutely, they, they can be really helpful for many, many reasons. But I realised that, and this might just be me, that I wasn't a very good listener as a psychotherapist because I was almost in my training, or the way I interpreted it is, you know, as soon as you sat in front of someone, you're already doing a treatment plan in your head. Mm. You're assessing what they need. And now it's like, how the hell do I know what they need? Mm. They know what they need. All my job is to point them in a different direction of where they're looking now, which is I'm broken, I'm mentally ill. Um, and what we do- Do you think they are though? They I don't think anybody's broken. No. Absolutely nobody. And I don't I, believe. You know, everyone's saying, I think this is the thing. I, you are meant to go through life feeling things. And mm -hmm. part of that experience is feeling bad things mm -hmm. and feeling stress. Mm -hmm. And Embrace, how we interpret it and, and how we see and exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's to be embraced. Yeah. And it's seeing that we're not we're not perfect and our experience of life isn't perfect, but it can be near as damn it when we accept it yeah. for what it is. And people say to me, you don't, and I've said this to you before, I will sometimes get trolled. Like, if you think it's that simple, you haven't experienced anxiety. Well, I'm like, how bad do you want me to be? Like, yeah. I was locked I was up for a, month. for a month. I was drugged up to high oh. heavens. Like, I'm not sure how bad I need to be for you to understand that I really get it. I did really suffer. But we, as a society, even like in lockdown, I was so busy in lockdown. And, you know, I got even busier the more it was talked about in the media that we're having a mental health crisis. And we're like, yeah, because we're doing the same old shit that we've been doing for however long that is like sticking plasters on people. Again, nothing against CBT. If it works for you, brilliant. But I've worked with hundreds, I'm not exaggerating, probably nearly thousands of people who've had it who it hasn't worked for. So why are we not now going, this maybe shouldn't be the only option that the GP has for people? Maybe... <sighs> This is controversial, but is it spoken about a bit too much that people are landing everything on mental health? Yeah, you can get to that point. I got to that point myself and I and I have to find the balance where I say to people, yes, talk to people if you feel you need to talk. Connection's important with other people. Connecting with others is really a great way to bring yourself, to lift your mood. But don't just talk about your anxiety all the time. That's all I used to do. I obsessed over it. From the second I woke up in the morning, am I anxious? Oh, yeah, I am. Okay, how am I going to get through the day? I tell my husband, how he, why he's, how he's still, I know why he's still with me, of course. Mm. Now, how he stayed with me through those years, I don't know. Because I must have done his head in. Constantly, I'm anxious, I'm anxious. I don't know if I'm anxious. I like the thought of it, I think. I don't know how he did it. He's very passive. That's how he did it. <laughs> Um, and he's reaping the rewards now, shall we say. But, <laughs> I'm joking. He, um, but I don't know how he did it because I was obsessed with being anxious. Right. It you was almost like my priority what? in life was being anxious because right, I didn't know any okay. different. And so, yes, we don't, I, I wouldn't recommend people tell everybody all the time that they're anxious. But again, I don't, I don't, not saying to people, don't talk about it and hold everything in if you feel like you need to get it out. But there is definitely a balance. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we can talk about, how anxious we are, how broken we are, how horrible a panic attack feels, but how are we moving forward from that? Exactly. Feel it, experience it, talk about it, See move it for on what it from really it. is as well. You know, when people, so when people have a panic attack, it's scary, mm. it's not a pleasant experience, but it's not unsafe. And so, again, one of the things that was massive change, life changing for me, and it sounds so silly now, is understanding a little bit about adrenaline, that when I 
tell myself something bad's going to happen. When I'm creating illusions, because anything forward from here on in is an illusion, even five minutes from now, it's never guaranteed. When I'm doing that, I'm sending a message to the part of my brain, the most primal part, the lizard brain, which is then in charge of my body temperature, adrenaline, my heart rate, which is why my heart rate speeds up. I feel all hot and clammy and sweaty. That is just the body doing what I told it to do. Yeah, The body's working in our favour, but we're just mis misusing the system. So what would happen is I'd get that surge of adrenaline and then I'd overthink that, thinking, oh shit, now I feel weak, now I feel dizzy, what's wrong with me? This is terrible, I'm sick of this. And what would happen then is the lizard brain goes, oh, there's more problems. Let's give her more adrenaline. And so the adrenaline only lasts in the body, like, don't quote me on this, but it's around eight minutes. After four minutes, it reduces by half. So when we learn to just be comfortable with that discomfort, yeah. it's going to go away within eight minutes. But the reason people people feel like they're in a constant panic, I was having panic attacks on the hour every hour for weeks at a time. That was because I was just re-triggering, re-triggering the system. And what over. was triggering you? Um, I could just have a random thought that might pop into my head and because, just then you, and then it's like, oh shit, what do I do, need to do with that? It's like disaster movie in Absolutely, the next Absolutely, which minutes. we can do really quick because yeah. and anxiety is a habit. Mm. It's a habit of overthinking. It's a habit of overanalyzing. And again, people don't like that because it's simplifying it. It's not just a habit, it's serious. Well, it can have serious consequences when we don't understand it and, you know, it's painful, but it is a habit. It's a habit of overthinking everything. And so... In the simplest of terms, I got much more comfortable with the discomfort. And now it doesn't feel like discomfort necessarily. Um, I'm a big believer in that. So I voluntarily do really hard things, mm -hmm. you know, to the people who go, you're crazy, you're mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you voluntarily do hard things, you know, when you have a really shit day and mm -hmm. something very difficult comes on your plate, you can bat that off. Yeah. You know, because yeah. I think I've been here before. Don't and a lot of it's it. about perspective as well, of like looking at the bigger picture. And when yeah. we get in our heads, so you're either in your head or in your life. And you're in your life, you're feeling peaceful. If you're in your head, you're either feeling good, bad, indifferent, depending on what your thinking is. And so if you're in your head, so, and again, how you experience it is all your perception. I remember my brother did, went through a stage, my youngest brother of doing MMA fighting. I couldn't watch him. I hated it because he was like my baby brother. Mm. And he used to say that he would, as soon as he stepped into that ring, the adrenaline was so severe that you can't hear anything. You feel like you could pass out, but he loved it. Now that is the same feeling as a panic attack, that massive surge of adrenaline that some people go out looking for, that love it, that crave it, mm. because they don't see it as a bad experience. He, did, he had a panic attack when his second child was born. And he told me, and he said, I had to go out the room for a second and sort of ground myself. And I felt, I said, oh God, I feel awful that that happens. He's like, oh, it was fine. I don't mind that feeling. He says, it makes me feel like I'm alive. And again, that's his experience of that. And yet for me, that is the, fi that is the feeling that I tried so hard to avoid for so many years because I hated it. But by trying to avoid it, I was consistently creating Well, it. you're absolutely right. There's adrenaline junkies out there who love yeah. extreme, and it's the extreme same. sports, extreme situations. It's the same feeling. The only difference of them experiencing that versus me experiencing panic was my thinking around it. This is mm. awful. This is horrendous. Whereas they were like, oh my terrible. God, I am literally like on I'm top of the world. It. Exactly, it. exactly. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, that's, again, what if people start to see that and understand that. I mean, I'm not saying now I love the feeling of panic, but it's very different if I, uh, you know, I've had one panic attack in the last pretty much nearly 10 years from having them daily. Uh, but it was still, it wasn't a terrible experience because it was like, yeah, of course I'm panicking. I've been in my head for three days. I've been mm. going over every scenario. It was when I found out I was pregnant at 45. I've gone through every scenario. How are we going to manage? Of course, my body is now responding as though I'm faced with danger because I've told myself for three days I'm faced with danger. Yeah. And so I was much more accepting of it. And what would have in the past gone from days to weeks to months stopped after about three days. And I just felt okay again. And I was okay and still am now. And, you know, I was going to say touch wood, but actually if I had a panic tomorrow, so be it. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to look at it. Mm -hmm. You are uh, now a new mum at, you know, new mum again at 45. Mm -hmm. um, big hot topic in the news, actually, in the last couple of weeks. We've seen loads of older ladies having babies, whether through IVF or whatever. That's great. Um, what's that experience like? I have found it 
you know, my 16 year old might listen to this and she gets it. She understands she's read my book. She knows how I suffered and, and we talk very openly. But the, and she, so she knows that this experience for me postnatally has been an absolute dream in comparison to where I was at when I had her. And I've just been so much kinder to myself, patient. If I'm absolutely exhausted and I need an extra night and my husband's feeling okay, I will say to him, can you have her tonight? I know you had her last night, but can you have her again? I have no shame attached to that anymore because I'm doing my best. Um, it's nice a really hard a job. partner who will do that. Yeah, it is. And not everybody does. But actually, no. <laughs> if you do, there's lots of people out there that do have the support if they directly ask for it, but don't ask for it. So, you know, so I get that. But even if I still had to do that, I don't, I, I don't get caught up in the fact. So, you know, say, let's say, for example, intrusive thoughts. When I had um, Maya, my 16 year old, I had lots of intrusive thoughts, which scared me. And that's why I didn't want to be on my own. So like, I remember <laughs> people are going to think I'm a lunatic. I remember lying in bed one night thinking, I'd never slept walk in my whole life, but I thought, what if I sleepwalk, go downstairs, get a knife, come up and kill her and kill my husband? So this thought came into my head. So then I'm laying in bed going at night going, you absolute psycho, what is wrong with you? Everybody has those thoughts. Yeah. At the time though, I'm like, you're terrible, just ruminating to the point where it then escalated to where I was like, mum, I don't want to be on my own with her, please can you stay with me? Whereas this time we've got um, we've got a chapel in Wales and it's got like a, a lovely mezzanine glass window. And I remember after having Aria, uh, stood there and just having this awful flash image of, imagine if you dropped her all through her and she was on the floor covered in blood. But I just laughed to myself because I'm like, you're tired, love. Yeah. Get an earlier night. And, that's and I think more people now. need to talk about that. Everybody yeah. has these like sadistic thoughts. and it's not do. It's not that you actually want to act on it. It's you are just playing out a scenario that could happen and you're almost like defending we against it. We can't control it. our thoughts. No. We cannot control the thoughts that we have. So I've, again, worked with people who literally destroy themselves because they have a thought pop into the head about their child. It might even be a sexual thought pops into their head because they've been looking at something else or thinking something else and they look at the child and they go, oh, connect the two. And like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Am I a paedophile? No, you can't control a thought. Yeah. We can. We only thing we can control is how we respond to that thought. And that's very different. We can't help thoughts that come into our head. And so again, that's a big part of what I teach is people not paying attention to their thoughts because they're, they're not truths, they're not facts, they're just thoughts. And that's where something like CBT, you can have an experience of, oh, trying to control your thoughts. Well, good luck, because you can't. What's CBT? So cognitive behavioral therapy, it's like you'll look at, um, try to, then I'm not doing it justice here, but like looking at um, trying to be more in control of your thoughts, try, you know, turning things from, negative into positive but when you're in a really low state of mind sleep deprived whatever you've got no chance mm. of doing that so it's about more accepting that the thoughts will pop in but what if that's okay what if you don't need to get rid of them because yeah. they don't mean anything I once did a talk at um, a company of solicitors and I remember like being surrounded by horrified faces because I said um, thoughts are all neutral so I might wake up and go shall I have tea or coffee shall I kill my husband today they're both neutral thoughts they don't mean anything they're like well yeah they do clearly if you're thinking that about your husband, that's weird. I'm like, no, it means something now because you've just attached a load of stuff to it. I think a group of solicitors would say that's the mens rea, you've got the guilty mind because that's <laughs> like, that. I did a, tried to do a law degree, only turned a couple of times to it. But my one of the, one of the lessons going. I remembered <laughs> was the mens rea, the guilty mind. Did they have the guilty mind? And that was one of my first ever lectures on criminal and criminal law. And, um, and it's like critical in a murder case. Mm -hmm. So they would say, well, it absolutely, so if you would have, say something did yeah. happen to your husband. But they'd link it to that. Yeah, of course, course they, they would. would yeah. But how many people are going around having horrible, scary thoughts or sexual inappropriate thoughts or like, you know, I have a dream, wake up in the morning and I've, I remember bringing my friends and saying, I had a dream last night, me and you were lesbians and we were getting it on. It's like, and we were laughing about it. Do I then start thinking that I'm a lesbian? No, I know that I'm not. But it doesn't, so again, we don't need to attach so much to the thoughts that we have because it is in the day our thoughts it's just like we're dreaming at night it's just that we're more consciously aware of it it's no different it's just a load of random thoughts that we then create our reality by giving importance and respect to certain thoughts and not to others um but in terms of when you were saying about experiencing as a as an older parent one of the things that pissed me off if i'm honest is i mean the midwives and the hospital were, were wonderful but every single time they open my notes, it's like, oh, you do know that you're high risk of this, you're high risk of that. And you don't. And if I was an anxious person like I was before, that would have tipped me over the edge. Whereas actually I just paid zero attention whatsoever. I didn't have any 
health issues throughout my pregnancy. Baby has no health issues as we Maybe know your of. biological age is younger. So you've got your chronological age, obviously how many times you've been around the sun. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's people who are older than the actual age that they are, you know, because they've lived a life of like terrible diet, terrible mm -hmm. lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, excess everywhere. And they might be biologically older. And then you've got people who have been living like monks who are like biologically younger. You yeah. might be one of those people. And so biologically, you well, know, my you body, might be a I mean, I don't feel younger. it because I, I had really bad um, <coughs> morning sickness, not morning sickness. What do you call it? I don't even know how to say it. Hyper whatever. Oh, what? um, yeah, it's that um, sickness thing. Calvin, look it up. No, I'm only joking. It's, uh, I know exactly. You know Kate Middleton I mean. had it. Yeah, so yeah. I had that. So I lost three stone in pregnancy. And then... Um, once Bet you look I, gorgeous. I actually <laughs> looked, nice I looked the hottest I've looked in a long time, <laughs> let me tell you. But then as soon as I, I got my appetite back for food and I just went on a, I probably had a takeaway every night for about three weeks. So yeah. anyway, um, so it's that kind of, um, that was what was frustrating. And I always, and I remember as well, so I had to go in for an induction because I'm old. So they wanted to induce me because of risk, which... And when they came to give me, they did the inspect, you know, checked me over and they said, oh, you've already started, so we can't give you the pastry yeah. or whatever. So we're going to keep you in here and we're going to take you down, but it could be a couple of days. So I had to stay in hospital. I felt like absolute shit because I didn't sleep. Yeah. So then I started to feel really anxious because I'm exhausted yeah. and I know I'm about to go and give birth. So by the time, two days later, I was going down to give birth, I was felt highly anxious. Did they make you have a C-section? Yeah. Well, mm. I had an emergency one in the end. Um, but... So I was highly, highly anxious and I made the mistake of going down and she said to me, how are you? I said, I'll be honest, I feel really anxious, not slept mm. for two nights. Oh my God. The whole way through, every time my blood pressure slightly went up and I'm having a contraction, by the way, yeah. of course it's going to go up. She'd say to the doctor, she's anxious, she gets anxious. I'm like, no, I didn't tell you that I get anxious. I told you this morning that I was fucking anxious because I've not slept for two nights. People jump on it. It's like, oh, she's I know, anxious. But if they didn't, then, and you'd said it, and then they didn't take that into account, it's I like, know, what it's can they do? But it's frustrating yeah. because it's like, because then I'm like questioning myself, am I anxious? Am I stressing myself out? And I'm like, no, I'm giving birth. I'm in labor and I'm in agony. Like, this is again normal. Yeah. Um, and it just is that. But again, because on my medical records, it will say. How are you in labor? Uh, pretty. Well, I don't know, my husband might say different. Pretty chill, pretty quiet. I cried a lot in my first daughter's labour, but I think that was the gas and air. Yeah. And this one, it went really quick because they induced me, but she had her hand on her head and she wouldn't move it. So I had to have a doctor try and go in and move her hand. And then they couldn't take their hand out from me. It's because so weird, isn't it? It's the it? weirdest thinking, feeling. Oh, I, I had the same. Someone rummaging around, breaking my waters, just yeah. uh, in, giving me internals every two. She's like, do you mind? I'm like, I don't care. Just do Whatever. it. Whatever. Get yeah. your arm up there. Whatever you've got to do at yeah. that point. I'm like, do it. And I was a complete, we well, can imagine what I was like. I had no patience whatsoever. And after mm. two days and they're saying, you, you need an emergency C-section. I still wouldn't give in. I was like, no, I can get her out. Like, I was nine and a half centimetres and they were like, it's got to be now. She and you've got to stuck. trust. You've got to trust them as well because they're making... I know, but I, I, I had to apologise to them afterwards because I was an absolute... They'll be well used to it. Of course they are, but They'll I felt be well terrible because, you know, I've got a lovely little neat caesarean <laughs> section scar now. Yeah, I think they're, they're quite good minds, really neat and tidy yeah. as well, but they are, they, they, you know, it's so advanced now, isn't it? But it's yeah. that... Um, I wouldn't bother any... I, I wouldn't do... Like, and now I've got the scar. If I was ever to do it again, I'd just go and get it. Well, get it out definitely, of shop's definitely closed for me. Yeah, yeah. 45... <laughs> Shop's definitely closed. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, it, I think, it's that, again, it's one of them things you just got to trust, give in and go, it, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. But um, so I've had a natural birth. Well, I don't like that term, but and a C-section actually. And I think actually giving birth naturally is way easier than having a C-section. Yeah. It, after two days, which is the same as me, 48 hours, I was like done in. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah. And I'd had everything through the kitchen sink, I'd had the epidural, mm -hmm. I had induction, pessary, you name it, I had it. And she wouldn't come out, too comfy. Well, when I went in, I could, mine was the opposite. She was trying to get out and that was, they were worried that she was going to punch through something. So that's why they took me for the emergency section because when, the, when they did one of the uh, checks, the midwife said, never in her whole career has this happened, but my daughter 
latched onto her finger and held her hand wow. by her head. So that's why they had to have two of them at the same time, one of them letting go and the other one holding it. But as I was going in to be, get ready for the C-section, just rushed me straight through, I could feel a tickle in me. I could actually feel a it? little hand there. It's the strangest and now feeling. And now you bet you're like stroking her head when she's going to sleep, you're looking at little hands and you're like... She oh still sleeps God. with her head in that same position on her hand. Yeah, no, but um, yeah, it's crazy. But going back to this idea of these three principles, the mind part is very much talking about that stuff of we are all connected to the same energy of life. We come from the same source. Whether you believe in God or not, it doesn't matter. Mm. We all know there's something bigger at play than us, whatever we want to call it. And for me, things like giving birth, growing a human is all a wonderful reminder of how phenomenal we are and that we're where we come from and that universal intelligence behind life. And yet here we are overthinking a presentation next week. It's like, look at the bigger picture. We are phenomenal. Well, that is very true. And I always go, listen, no one's dead. Whenever, and whenever, even if they do, you're still all right. Uh, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> listen, like whenever anything stressful comes on my plate, I'm like, whatever. And like people have got, but you're going to spend that amount of money on that. What if it doesn't work? I'm like, well, no one's dead, are they? And what we're going to do, not try. Yeah. What we're going to do. Exactly. So let, and it's, it's not like, let's not stress about it. Yeah. You know? And sometimes you can find yourself getting caught up in it without wanting to. But again, that's part of human nature that you get caught in the he in your head. But as soon as, if you have this understanding, as soon as you realise that's what you're doing, that's a wonderful opportunity to stop. Yeah, it was. I'll tell you what the situation came up recently was Elle magazine were doing us for trademark dispute because we're called Elle Sarah. And my solicitor is painting this picture and he's like, you know, if you lose your name, you're then going to have to have a rebrand that's going to cost like, you know, you tell me how much it's going to cost. So I'm doing the mental figures probably in the region of about 100, 150,000 to replace all the stock, do new packaging, do new mm. website, do everything. Everything has got mm -hmm. to change because we ch we have to change the name because they want us to. And he said, as long as you're prepared to risk that, I'm like, yes, I am. Uh, no one's dead. And they're like, well, just so you know. And I was so close to actually changing the name. I was actually about to sign the paper. And be then I went into birth. And I realised what I'd just done. And I thought, fuck that. Mm. Fuck you and fuck that. Yeah, Literally. I'm it's the phenomenal. only way. I, yeah. <laughs> in, I'm sat in the hospital about not sleep, completely full of adrenaline. Text me solicitor. All deal is off the table. I'll speak to you on Monday. So what's happened with that now? Um, I won. Yay. <laughs> they retracted, well, after a lot of protracted negotiations which went on for two years but I was like no I'm not prepared to agree to anything well, I could understand if it was just L but it's not tell it's not me about it oh it was just ridiculous and I was like I'm not living in a world where my little girl thinks I've just bent over for these people if I truly believe there was an infringement on trademark then yeah I would have been a bit more like oh it could I go either way that. yeah but yeah. I was like no and it cost me 12,000 pounds to defend it and everyone was like oh even people on Instagram when I was talking about it, just change it. Why do you want the stress? Why do you want the stress? I was like, It doesn't no. have to be a stress. It would be more stress. Whether I, let's say, and I was like, my argument was, they want me to change my name. If I lose, I still have to change my name. So why don't I just go for it? See if... Nothing see to what, lose. Exactly, I've got nothing to lose. So either way, I'm going to spend that amount of money changing it. So that's what I did. But everyone was like stressing out around me. I was like, no one's dead. In the end, if we change the names, we've got a really great story about why we did it. Yeah, great. It's great marketing. Perfect. So I was like... So you get to let, keep it, let's though. It's just, great. Let's just chill out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe I'm an optimist. I don't know what it is. But I just don't sweat the small stuff. And a lot of people say that's not small stuff, but it's not life But whether something's big or small, again, is perspective. Yeah. It's how we, how we, if we make it big or we make it small. You know, and when I wouldn't leave the house and I was really severely anxious, somebody knocking at the door, the sound of the doorbell felt like a big deal. Yeah. You know, so it depends on your state of mind, your mood, you know, a, a number of things of just, yeah, it's all part of being human and it's very normal. And if we could only have these conversations more often about the simplicity, about the, um, you know, us not, buying into this idea that we're broken because we're absolutely not. And people will say, yeah, but what about schizophrenia? But what about this? Like there is not one, what if someone's got autism? What? 
they can still access more peace of mind. It might look different to somebody else, but there is not a human being on this planet that cannot access more peace of mind. And that's what we need to be looking at instead of this mental health crisis we tell ourselves that we've got. Yeah, maybe there isn't a crisis. I just think there's a huge misunderstanding. Correct, I would agree that whatever they're doing to treat this crisis is not the answer. And mm. actually the answer is within yourself. It's not probably sat in a GP's office with a prescription in their hands. It's actually probably something that you're not addressing within yourself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, but what do I know? Um, okay, <laughs> sorry. So uh, if the ladies listening to this want to get hold of you, mm -hmm. how can they get in touch? So I'm Sari Taylor coaching all over socials. Um, my website, my company is Worldwide Wellbeing Limited, um, which is just worldwidewellbeinglimited.co.uk. No, it's not limited. It's worldwidewellbeing.co.uk. You can find everything on there. I've got loads of um, free resources and podcasts and things. If people are just curious mm. about the three principles, which is how it started for me, uh, then I would massively encourage you to either go and have a look on my website, um, which will direct you, or just literally look, look up Sid Banks. There's some really old-fashioned videos on there of him talking. Um, and just explore, because as cheesy as it sounds, it's literally transformed my life. And I know through working with thousands of others that I am absolutely not the only one. That's great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks.